Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, I'm just turning around to look at the clock. Uh, what have we got here? What time is it? 20 to 7. So it's 20, 20 minutes before 7 o'clock. Oh, gosh, it's been a busy day. I've been working. Um, I got back today, today, Sunday. I got back on Friday from Clifton which was a wonderful experience and thank you very much Terry and Lol. And I worked yesterday down in the woodland. Um, I'm sort of eager to get the paths opened and things cleared a little bit and especially as we're coming into September now, um, another couple of days. I went to the boot fair this morning. I don't know if you can see this, I'll just go up close. And I got this beautiful basket for Jack. So I've put his little mat, his little thermal, little heated mat in there. So he's very excited, tail wagging. Um, before I take you outside, I want to thank Lisa from Leichenstein. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your beautiful gifts and especially the cushion that the cushion is gorgeous. Thank you so much. So you'll be seeing the cushion in future videos because it's on my sofa at the moment. So I've been working around the back um, of the cottage since I came home from the bird fair. But this morning uh, I did a, a live video, a live feed or whatever it's called on Facebook because you know it's very easy to to connect with Facebook um, and do a live. So someone from my home county um, said hello on the Facebook live and reminded me that my county of Tyrone in Northern Ireland is called Tyrone Among the Bushes. And it suddenly sparked a memory in me. And I talked a little bit about this this morning on the video, on the live stream. Two things. Well, three. But we'll start with the first thing. When I was a child, um, so this is a little bit about me to start with. I was born into a tiny little terraced house in Oma. Um, it was a little, tiny little two bedroomed, two bedroomed terraced house with no bathroom and a toilet outside in what is known in Ireland as a yard, which is not a garden by the way. It's a little concrete rectangle, probably measuring about 15 feet by 5 feet, something like that. And that's where the toilet was. So there was no bathroom and it was very impoverished. But of course at the time, as a child, it never occurred to me <laughs> that we were impoverished. It was only when I went to school, you know, and I kind of felt that vibe from the nuns and from teachers that I was lower than quite a few other children. But then there were quite a few other kids as well who were on the same level as me um, in financial penury <laughs> or coming, coming from a home where it was quite a regular thing that I would go up to borrow six or seven slices of bread from my grandmother, you know. My mother would send me up with a plate and say, see if your nana has six or seven slices of bread going spare. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. You see, <clears throat> this is probably why I do laugh a lot and why I don't take um, things too seriously. Because when you come from that level of impoverishment, you know, look, you don't actually get any lower than that ever again in your life. You can only go up. So, anyway. <clears throat> so that's just this little perspective of... Uh, where I lived. So, 
at one point, whether my father borrowed a car or I don't know what happened, but he decided he was going to take us all out to visit a forest. I've never, I'd never been in a forest before in my life. <laughs> so it was terribly exciting because, of course, you know, we may have been poor, but we were all readers, and me particularly, I loved reading all the Enid Blyton stories and uh, Biggles. <laughs> Biggles. <laughs> Don't ask me why an Irish child was reading about a Second World War Royal Air Force pilot. <laughs> Don't ask me. I don't know. But anyway, <clears throat> so my father borrowed this car and said, we're all going out on this day outing. <laughs> day outing. <laughs> I just remember being squashed in the car and being sick on the kind of three or four miles we had to travel. <clears throat> on this day outing to this forest. And it was a public forest and it was called... The Gorton Glen Forest Park. Now, I'd never seen a forest before. Because where we lived, there were no trees. There was nothing like that, you know. Um, although we would go out, uh, we'd kind of walk out of the town and go into the wild a little bit, you know. But, uh, oh, and by the way, there were 11 of us in this two-bedroom terraced house. <laughs> Oh, gosh, my poor mother. If there is a goddess, you know, enjoying the other world, it is my mother. Bless her. Anyway, <clears throat> so it was terribly exciting. There was lots of midges. So I associated trees at that point with midges. And it wasn't until, because when I, mean, I was about maybe eight or nine years old or something like that. And it wasn't until years and years later when I had long since uh, moved to London and, you know, it was ye years after I got married and quite a few years after I had my children when I began to take the children to places that were forests that I realised what I'd seen what I had been introduced to as a forest was nothing less than a Sitka Spruce concentration camp that's what I call it because all there were were Sitka Spruce thousands upon thousands of Sitka Spruce it was a plantation, planted for money, harvested on a regular basis. And the last time I went up to Oma, I decided to go on a little, go on a little, you know, sort of memory lane thing. And I drove out to the Gorton Glen Forest Park, which is now... You know, to my eyes, it's, it's, it's absolutely just a Sitka Spruce plantation. <sighs> and I realised, I was sort of, I got a wee bit angry, actually. I got a wee bit angry because I realised that I'd been lied to. Now, my father probably didn't know any better <laughs> because he'd probably never seen a forest. And... Uh, Because it was called a forest, because there were signs up saying Forest Park, it was just accepted that it was a forest, you see. So, I'd been lied to because it wasn't a forest. It was a plantation. It was a Sitka spruce, as I say, a tree concentration camp. Well, they just planted thousands upon thousands of trees all together, squeezed them in, squashed them in, lined them up, and put a big sign up. So, <clears throat> 
I do feel a bit aggrieved about this because over the past 16 years that I've been here working on the Bealtaine project I realise that I've been fed a lot of lies in the past lots and lots of lies so when people talk about the matrix I can assure you there is a matrix and, and, and people are fed all kinds of nonsense within that within that invisible structure you see so <clears throat> it is a shame now when I think that my native county is referred to as Tyrone among the bushes because Ireland during Tudor times was the most forested country in Western Europe. Now, you know when I say a wood or a forest, I'm referring to deciduous trees. I'm not referring to plantations. I'm not referring to monoculture plantations. So, of course, we all know from the history what happened. Ireland was invaded. Hardwood, which you would have found in the oak and the ash. Hardwood was the commodity of the day. In the same way as oil is the commodity of this day. So Ireland was stripped of its beautiful forests because the entire economy was predicated on hardwood the ships were constructed from hardwood the palatial buildings had all hardwood timbers the castles the churches the government buildings of the day all needed hardwood. So Ireland was stripped and stripped ravenously to such an extent that those of you who are familiar with Ireland will know of the Burren. The Burren, B-U-R-R-E-N. The Burren in County Clare is a limestone plateau. And over recent years, they have discovered that the Burren was, in fact, a forest. So, the limestone plateau is simply the product of erosion. Because you take the trees out, and the rain washes away the soil and it has revealed a limestone plateau. But getting back to Tyrone among the bushes, isn't it now time that it was called Tyrone among the forests or Tyrone among the trees? or to roam among the woods. If ever there was a pivotal point in the history of humankind when it was imperative to plant trees, it's now. It is now. And then I thought about how I planted trees. Those of you who read my book, A Cottage in Three Acres, will know that I had no money, that I had no help, that it was one woman fulfilling a dream to create a woodland 
on three acres of almost impossible to plant land. It was something that had to be done, had to be proved that regardless of the land you have, regardless of the land that is available, woodlands and forests can be planted and planted with ease and planted with very little financial aid. So that, that then brought me to the the billionaires of the world. The billionaires. And I'm not going to mention names, but there are billionaires who are involved in vaccinating populations and there are billionaires who are involved in food aid and there are billionaires who are involved in all kinds of what they perceive to be and I'm not going to discuss this or argue over it, what they perceive to be programmes of good in the world. doesn't matter what we perceive them to be. That's another debate for another day. And this, isn't, this video is not about vaccines. But I do believe if people with money and power to do anything they want to change the world for the good if they were to set about creating woodlands and forests in all countries starting with their own by the way then that would be a legacy worth cheering on and that would be a legacy that would be of great substance, of great value. And I can't think of any other legacy that would have that amount of value to it. I really can't. And then beautiful counties like my native county, Tyrone. Could adopt a new name. Tyrone among the trees. Tyrone in the woods. Tyrone of the great forests. Wouldn't that be something? It's gone very silent. I suppose because it's getting late now. There's a real touch of lunacy now in the air. And the beautiful birch trees, they're the first, they're the first beautiful trees to colour, the leaves to colour and drop. Beautiful. Now there's a few other people I have to say thank you to. But I have their cards and letters in my bag, so I'll do that another day. My daughter is in the middle of constructing handrails here and there. <laughs> she does worry about me traipsing across, you know, tripping across these wet pieces of bedrock and such like and jumping across streams where there's nothing to hold on to of course I'm hoping hoping to get some more land keep on planting 
I have a huge urge to plant. I could plant another three acres easily. No problem. And the cottage is beginning to open up a little bit there. I did a massive amount of cutting back on the dogwoods there, so they do look a little bit um, <laughs> raggedy. But of course, um, some of the stems on them are like 12, 15 feet high. But I needed to open up some light here in this area for these little birch trees. I want to get them up into the canopy, you know, and then let the dogwood fill in again. And of course, in all the cutting back, which was hard work, every so often I stopped, I looked around, and lo and behold, the beautiful catalpa tree, which was almost impossible to see. And that was something that I planted in there, it must be 13 years ago. It was brought to me in a pot as a gift by someone. And it sort of found its, found its space. And then I look further up and there's a rowan tree there. I don't know where that's growing from. I think this could be it here. You see, <clears throat> with shrubs, I think this is the rowan tree here, has a sort of a silvery bark on it. But with shrubs, of course, there's um, there's a propensity to sort of lose the trees a bit, and you really have to look up or be able to look across, which I'm not. I'd need to have one of those tree houses to do that. So, it's beautifully still, very quiet. Every so often you hear a flutter of wings as the bird, a bird makes a move. Quite a lot of little robins now following me around the garden. Usually when I sit down somewhere. So I'll go and get this little video uploaded. Now I managed to get at the boot fair as well um, a DVD. I don't know if any of you have watched it. It's called The Hours. So I'm looking forward to watching that later. And then tomorrow, of course, Monday, I'll do the post. Um, I haven't got the books back from the printer just yet, but I'm poised, ready for a phone call tomorrow or Tuesday. I expected to collect them on Friday, but anyway, it's a couple of days late. So Monday or Tuesday I expect the books to be ready and then there'll be a massive amount of work posting them off. But I've already made a start on the, all the envelopes, so I'm about halfway there with all the orders. But I'm just so excited to see the book actually in print. So blessings to you all on this beautiful Sunday evening. Blessings to you all.